Good evening and welcome to Kiro Gerstein Invites, an online forum hosted here at the Kronberg Academy. And today I have the pleasure of being here not only virtually, but also in person. This time I'm live from Kronberg Academy. And uh, joining us today is uh, the great pianist, scholar, improviser, teacher, 
musicologist Robert Levin. In fact, uh, one could, could go on and on talking about all the incredible things he has done, completing the Mozart Requiem, uh, being uh, the editor of many editions, not only of uh, Mozart, uh, but also of C.P. Bach. Um, so one could go on and on, but I think you know how brilliant Robert is, and it's a thrill that he's, that he's agreed to join us to talk about the Mozart piano concertos. And um, without wasting too much, too much time, uh, let's, let's say hello to Robert. Hi, Robert. And, uh, Thank you. And start, and start this seminar. And I'm sure we all have very much to learn. And I'm delighted that we're all here gathered virtually, but together. Thank you very much. It's a privilege and a great pleasure to be with you in this seminar. And uh, there's a lot to talk about. And I'm sitting at the moment at a uh, period piano, a McNulty copy of a Walter und Sohn, a slightly younger piano than the one that Mozart owned, which was, by the way, the piano that you would have heard just now in the introduction. That was a performance, a live performance. The synchronization between video and audio is unfortunately suboptimal, uh, but uh, it's a pretty accurate uh, audio rendering of what we did. And it was on Mozart's own piano. I think it's the first time, actually, that Mozart's piano was used for uh, piano concerto recordings of that kind. We did the, uh, the B flat major 450, which you heard, some of the first movement and the coronation concerto. K-175, the fifth piano concerto, and the Rondo D major, K-382. Um, I think it's good for me to spend a minute or two at this uh, replica to be able to outline to you a, a bit of, of the characteristics of such an instrument and how they differ from the pianos that we're used to today. And here I'm less interested in aesthetics than I am in just mechanical elements of construction. Uh, for one thing, um, an octave on this instrument is the equivalent of a seventh on a Steinway. Can you hear me? Yes, very much so. Good. Um, so if you go back and forth between playing on a, on a replica instrument or an original instrument and a Steinway, you have to do a lot of adjusting. Also, the key dip is much shallower on an instrument like this, which makes life a lot easier uh, for certain kinds of technical passages. Um, like the end of the Beethoven Waldstein uh, last movement where he asks you to play a, a double glissando with the thumb and the fifth finger, which is a, a lot easier to do on this piano. Um, the instrument is parallel strung and the result of its being parallel strung is that it's possible to play both hands at the same volume, which is not really possible on an overstrung piano of the kind that we're used to. You usually have to bring out the melody and play the left hand more discreetly. So these are practical issues that one responds to as a performer just intuitively. You sit there and you notice how the instrument wants to be played and you try to play it that way because you always get a better uh, response in, in that respect. Naturally, the strings are much more uh, thin. They're, they're not nearly as thick as the ones that we have. And the difference in sustaining power has a lot to do with the fact that there's approximately a 2,000 kilogram resistance string tension on this instrument whereas uh, on a Steinway it's more like 20,000 kilograms. So that accounts for the fact that the instrument will sustain a great deal more. It also means that you can do the kinds of things that Beethoven did with holding the pedal for a great distance. Um, and you can even do it say in the Mozart C minor concerto at the end of the see I didn't change the pedal once in that passage and of course Beethoven does the same thing at the end of the first movement of his third piano concerto modeled on the Mozart C minor concerto so these are characteristics that one learns when playing on the earlier instrument and they're very exciting and they're kind of stimulating now uh, I am going to move over to a Steinway now um, 
This is uh, an instrument that belonged to the late Malcolm Frager, who was a great friend of mine and a colleague, beloved colleague of mine. So I'm going to take the, uh, the uh, laptop and move it over there and then talk about some of the other things that are uh, mentioned in the synopsis in the banner that you received. So just give me a second and I'm going to move over. We shall, we shall follow you in, in spirit and in body. Here we are. Now, let's, let's just see. I think this is all right, no? Yes. Good. Good. Okay, so it's a little bit higher in pitch. Um, when Mozart went to London in 1765 or so, he made a seminal, a seminal acquaintance with the composer Johann Christian Bach, the youngest practicing musician, son of Johann Sebastian Bach. And he had, Christian Bach, had, when his father died, moved in with his elder brother, Carl Philip Emanuel Bach, who trained him for some time. He was 15 when his father died. And then he went to uh, Italy, converted to Roman Catholicism, had an assistant organ position at the cathedral in Milan, and later moved to England, where, together with his fellow countryman Karl Friedrich Abel, a composer, gamba player, uh, conductor, they founded the Bach Abel concerts, which became very, very popular in England. And uh, Mozart met him there, and there are wonderful stories told about them. That, for instance, uh, Mozart sat in the lap of, of Christian Bach. And together, collectively, they improvised the sonata, and someone who wasn't there would never have guessed that it wasn't one person playing. Um, so uh, when Mozart learns of Christian Bach's death, he died on the 1st of January, 1782, he writes his father and says, have you heard that the London Bach is dead? What a great loss to, to the musical world. And at that point, Mozart was working on his A major piano concerto K414. And what's interesting, this is a known fact, but some of you may not be aware of it. When he came to compose the second movement of that concerto, he chose this tune. happens to be the middle movement of an overture by Johann Christian Bach, La Calamita dei Cuori. And so Mozart is, in effect, rendering homage to his beloved mentor by quoting that tune. And the second subject in that same middle movement is... which is... Mozart is in effect saying, I could not do what I can do now without you. So I mentioned Christian Bach because he was the most profound influence on Mozart as a composer, including Haydn, in Mozart's entire life. Mozart really learned a lot about composition from uh, Christian Bach, who had a very urbane, very elegant style. Um, Maybe some people would say oriented towards the musical surface, but it had a great deal of charm, a great deal of vivacity, and the arias that Mozart heard that were composed by Johann Christian Bach, uh, he heard performances of operas of Bach in London, were in a, a profound influence on Mozart. And the way that Christian Bach used thematic variety to create a sense of narrative left profound traces in Mozart. And Mozart created a, a quite a personal uh, sense of plot line, which I'm going to explain to you here by just taking a few representative piano concertos and showing you how this works. Um, other composers in France notably liked thematic variety, but they used it for its own sake and not necessarily for dramatic purpose. What Mozart managed to do is to give a sense of identity to individual themes and use them to help create a sense of plot line. So, for instance, the G major concerto of Mozart is 
Ty typical Mozart opening, sometimes they open forte, but more often than not, they, they begin with the orchestra playing piano. And the first idea of the piece is what we would call the principal theme. The next thing that happens is Mozart, in effect, says, let's party, let's have a good time. And we hear something which is energetic, forceful, and enthusiastic. <laughs> he arrives at a preparation for a half cadence saying we're halfway done are you interested to see what's going to happen when we do the other half you get this fanfare idea <laughs> and then we get to the second tune now if you keep up with me the first tune we heard that's idea number one the partying vivacious thing is number two. The fanfare with the half cadence halfway through is number three. Now we're at number four. Can you believe the number of tunes he's wasting, how much imagination Mozart is actually spending just on what is the first three or four minutes of a movement? We get number four, which is the secondary theme. <laughs> and then suddenly there's a big surprise with more energy. You'd think by now it would be time for the soloist to come in, but Mo Mozart isn't done showing his prodigious imagination. Now, having played something energetic to close, he's going to do something sweet and tuneful. conclusion and a fanfare to wrap things up and then finally it's time for the solos to come in so all of those tunes every single one of them will show up later in the piece but not randomly it's not a jigsaw puzzle each one of those has a purpose, as we saw. One is to say, here I am, it's a beautiful day, Hi, I feel good, how about you? Let's go out, have a good time. Here we are at an important arrival. Let's sit back and relax a little bit. Ooh, something exciting is going to happen. Well, that was great, wasn't it? Okay, let's get started. And all of those things have an individual idea. And this is something that, I mean, Haydn, Beethoven, would never waste that much material on an opening tutti like that because... They could write five pieces based on that material. Now, I chose the G major concerto not randomly because towards the end of this lecture, when I talk about cadenzas, how to make them, how to improvise them, this will be a very, very useful example. Anyhow, uh, what's interesting is that not only does Mozart spend a huge amount of imagination in presenting this material one tune after another, the fact that the soloist enters doesn't mean that his imagination is going to be turned off. The piano takes over many of the ideas of the orchestra, but it contributes ideas of its own. For instance, he starts by taking over the principal tune. And then the orchestra plays subserviently, quietly. Which is now quiet and excited, but not as energetic as before, which allows the piano to piggyback to suddenly get involved in something a little bit more florid. And then he, the piece goes exploring. And he takes us to D major. That's what you're supposed to do. In a good sonata in a major key, you go from one to five. So you're going to go here from, from G major to D major. And so when he does that, 
you expect it's time for the second theme. That's what you would expect because there he is asking the question. And the orchestra leads us into the next idea, which should have been the second tune, but Mozart is not ready for that. He wants to define D major from the soloist's point of view, not the orchestra. So we get... So it's pert, it's a little bit irreverent, uh, and in the end it's very touching. What is this music about? This music, in a sense, is selling D major to the audience. He's saying, come on, let's go out for dinner. I know a really good Chinese restaurant. Yeah, it's just around the corner. You want to come? It's that kind of equivalent of, of... Which is a very different thing than... And you're wondering whether he's actually going to substitute this for this. But you don't find out right away because this suddenly plunges into a world of passion and... Uh, recognize that. I recognize that. That's the fanfare halfway through the tutti, isn't it? That must mean that the second tune is coming. So what do you know? He manages to create this sense of plot line which looks backward at what was introduced by the orchestra and looks forward in presenting the soloist's personal material. And the whole piece continues in that way. I'm not going to spend the entirety of my lecture just talking about how Mozart uses different tunes, but I think all of you can do that yourself by just picking up a, a score, whether it's a two piano score or an orchestral score, and looking and tracing how these tunes come, where they come, and the effect that they have. When, when we get to the cadenza, you'll see how clever Mozart is at taking little snippets from different places in the piece and jumping backwards and forwards uh, to create what seems, therefore, to be totally spontaneous. Anyhow, uh, one of the things that I do want to talk about is what the role is of the soloist in playing a Mozart piano concerto. Because, first of all, we think of the piano soloist and the concerto as the you know, the, the primary person talking and, and, and acting in all of this with the orchestra as an accompaniment. And most of the time when we go to a performance of a Mozart piano concerto, the soloist and the conductor come out on stage, they both bow. If the uh, soloist is not a complete lout, he'll take the hand of the, of the leader, of the concertmaster, uh, and bow and sit down. And what next happens is the orchestra plays the opening tutti and the, the pianist sits there waiting for her or his turn to play and, and plays absolutely nothing. And in many performances, when the piano comes in for the rest of the concerto where there is a part for the soloist that's prescribed, that pianist will then play what's on the page in the edition, not one more note, not one less. And when it comes time for the cadenza, they will play Mozart's cadenza, which you've all heard a thousand times. Or if there is no concerto cadenza by Mozart, well, maybe they will have made up one. You know, uh, probably they've uh, listened to Brendel's or Pariah's, which are all very good, and transcribed them and played them uh, instead. Uh, because most people are trained to think that, that you have to venerate this music and worship it, but above all, don't mess it up. But if we actually look at the manuscripts to Mozart concertos, and by the time my talk is over, you will have had some looks at some color facsimiles of Mozart piano concertos. You'll see what his handwriting looks like, how he lays out a score, which is different from what you will find in the score that you purchased today. Um, Mozart presented himself in multiple roles as a soloist. The first one that you would encounter is shown by the fact that 
the left hand of the piano is directed to double the string bass part. In the early concertos, there are actually figures, figured bass in the good old basso continuo baroque tradition. But later on, when Mozart leaves Salzburg, instead he writes the abbreviation col basso with the bass, meaning the string bass, or col b. And what that means is that the soloist is to improvise along with the orchestra, which I was doing, by the way, in the B-flat concerto recording that you heard uh, a while back. And you are supposed to be as creative as, say, Duke Ellington or Count Basie were in their jazz bands. And interestingly enough, the way Mozart lays out his score is very, very much related to what swing jazz did, because at the bottom of the page, you'll see this in a little bit, at the bottom of the page, you see the timpani, and then the piano, and then the string bass and cello. Well, that's what the jazz people call the rhythm section. The piano, the drums, and the bass, and the only thing that's missing is the guitar. So it's, it's interesting to see that Mozart regards the rhythm section as a unit and you play along with the orchestra, not when the cello is playing, but the string bass is not, and not when the bassoons are playing, and then the string basses are not. This is very important because a lot of people, distinguished, very intelligent people like Charles Rosen, have claimed that this idea of writing the continual part is only as a placeholder so that the keyboard player knows where the, 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 mu the, the music is and can follow the the progress of the movement and not get lost. The problem with that is when you look at Beethoven's piano part to the Emperor Concerto, in forceful places he calls for the left hand to be played in octaves with itself. You're not going to be any more clear on where the music is and what the orchestra is doing with one note or with an octave. The reason that there's an octave is it's supposed to sound louder. This is a performance instruction. So one of the things that the soloist is supposed to do is to accompany the orchestra as the orchestra will later accompany the soloist. The next thing that you do is, of course, to create a lively presence for yourself in playing in the solo sections. And when tunes come back again, you are expected to decorate them. And I'm going to have a lot to say about that. Furthermore, there are two kinds of cadenzas that you encounter in Mozart concertos, the one that we all know about. <laughs> The arrival on the 6-4 chord, which is to be followed by the trill, and then the orchestra comes in and you get the play out. But there is also another kind of, of minor sort of mini cadenza, which happens most often when you arrive at a dominant 7th chord or at the dominant chord. So, for instance... Uh, Geza Anda plays exactly that. I know he does, and he was a great, great Mozart player, one of the great Mozart players of the 20th century. But there's a fermata there, and the fermata means that you're supposed to do something. Mozart calls these Eingänge, which are entries. So... <laughs> saying to the audience, you know what? No, I don't know. You shrug your shoulders. I don't know. Mozart, what do you have in mind? Ah, I'll, I'll do something. Watch. It's fun. Or in the C major concerto. from the fact that it's ungrammatical to go from from the seventh of the chord to the fifth of the C major chord. These are clearly invitations for improvisation. I'll get to it soon. Now, 
Uh, let's look at some musical examples. I'm going to ask uh, my dear friend uh, uh, Kirill to put up something that you can all look at. Can can you see it? Keep going. Next slide, please. Yeah. That's the that's the title yeah. slide. Now, uh, the important thing is that when a tune comes back, you are expected to decorate it. In the case of solo piano pieces, which were more often than not published, Mozart would write out the decorations himself. So we see here the A minor rondo, written to commemorate the death of Mozart's beloved friend, the Count Hatzfeld. And you see... comes back as and which then comes back slide there's more of this time you get to the end of, of this set of decorations there's a kind of an ecstasy of anguish which one feels as Mozart pulls here <laughs> until the end of the piece which sounds more like Chopin than Mozart <laughs> I think we get a sense here that the decoration that Mozart introduces is a way of intensifying the expression of the piece. It's not to show that you have quick and agile fingers. Now there are a number of, of solo piano pieces, sonatas and uh, rondos, where we get a kind of a crash course from Mozart in how to do this. Uh, we can go to the next slide please, and this one is the rondo in F major K494. Keep going. Next one. Thank you. Which becomes the next time. Finally, it's pretty uh, 
extraordinary stuff altogether. And for those of you who are contemplating improvising in the way that Mozart truly improvised these pieces before setting them down to paper, you might be inclined to say, well, look, I mean, that shows he has prodigious imagination. He's a genius and I'm not. He can do this. There's no way I could possibly do something like that. Um, but there is a way that you can do that. Um, and I think the way to do it is to understand the nature of how Mozart creates decoration in the music that he writes. Um, this is the F major sonata, K332, the middle movement, where when he writes in the score, we have, which is really quite astonishing. Um, but if you go through these decorations with a pencil, make a photocopy of them, and circle every note which has been added from the original version, and write down what it is. It might be syncopated. It might be arpeggiated. It might be some passing tones. It might be some neighboring tones. It might be a turn. There are any of these things that it might be. Once you know what they are and you've identified them, perhaps you'll be encouraged to realize, well, wait a minute, Mozart repeated a note. I can repeat a note. Mozart syncopated. I can syncopate. He put in a chromatic scale. Well, I, I, I can play a chromatic scale. And suddenly, if you think about it in a quantitative way instead of a qualitative way, you won't be quite so scared. Um, can we go on a little bit? We can do some skipping here. Please, no, Please, let's, uh, let's, yeah, you can, you let's can go on. You, you want me to, to go to the next page? Yeah, please. We're going to switch. This is more of the same. We can go on. That's fine. And that is too. Still skip. Very good example. This is the second movement of K309. Which he wrote for Rosa Kanabich, the daughter of Christian Kanabich, the composer and conductor. Uh, and this too gives many, many examples of, of extravagant decoration every time the tune comes back. And it's useful to know. Let's, let's go on forward because I don't want to uh, flog the dead horse here. So long as you know that these exist, you can look at them. That's more of the same and that's more of the same. Okay, now for those of you who, who, as I say, so respect and venerate Mozart that you're unwilling to, to decorate, let's look at some interesting examples from the piano concertos. It would seem to me that when the piano comes back and plays a tune, it would be normal, given the examples we've just seen for the, for the soloist, to decorate. But look at what we have here. We have the piano playing in the middle movement of the D minor concerto. To which the orchestra responds. And uh, all I can say about that is what else. No, no, it's all right. Go on to the next one. The next one is K503 and the piano plays. And the orchestra plays. Now I ask you, what kind of a situation is it when the orchestra has more imagination than the soloist? If that's the case, then you need to fire the soloist and get one that can, can at least invent something that's as interesting as what the orchestra is doing. At the very, very least, you should anticipate what the orchestra is doing so it sounds like the orchestra is imitating you and not that you're imitating the orchestra. But it's absolutely absurd to have the piano play while the orchestra plays. Mozart has to write out what the orchestra is going to play because after all, the orchestra is sight reading. There were almost no rehearsals in the late 18th century, so the orchestra is only going to play what Mozart tells them to play. He, on the other hand, Mozart, is making this stuff up all of the time. And as a result, he doesn't have to write down fanciful decorations of main themes because he knows what he's going to be doing himself. Um, okay, uh, let's, let's go on here. Yeah. Next, next slide. Now, uh, what we're looking at here it's a little hard to, to read. One second. Is the middle section of, uh, it's great. The middle section of the, the G major middle movement of the D major concerto K451. 
This is not a piece that we hear as often as some of the others, but I want you to notice what's going on. And now, since we're now looking at a Mozart orchestra score, uh, let me point out the order of the instruments because it's different from what we're used to. As you see, the top and bottom staves are blank. Uh, the top written sp uh, staff is first violin, followed by second violin, followed by viola. Then there's the flute, and then the oboe, and then the bassoon. Then there's an empty staff. There's room for empty staves here because this is a middle movement and there are no trumpets and drums. <clears throat> then you have the two staves of the piano, the solo piano part, and then on the bottom, as I've indicated before, <clears throat> the orchestra string bass. Now this is a kind of passage which I like to call a piano recitative. What happens is that the orchestra is accompanying in pulsating eighth notes. And the piano part is declaiming in a kind of syllabic way. It's not really a tune. It's interesting that as soon as Mozart sent this concerto to Salzburg, his sister wrote back and said, isn't there something missing in that passage? And Mozart wrote back and said, my sister is indeed correct that there is something missing in the C major passage from the concerto in D. I shall remedy the deficiency and send it as soon as possible together with the cadenzas. Yes, he had to send Nanerol the cadenzas because she couldn't improvise. She wasn't taught to improvise. He says to her on another occasion, I'm sorry it's taken me so long to spend, send the cadenzas, but you see, when I play this concerto, I just play the first thing that occurs to me. Now, if we go to the next page, this is Nanerl's handwriting of Mozart's decoration of the same passage. <laughs> So Mozart has written out the undecorated version, which he expects to be embellished. Now, if we go to the next slide, you can see all of this written out as printed in the new Mozart edition, now with modern score layout, in which the flute is on the top, followed by the oboe and the bassoon. And then you can see the piano part with the osea with the decoration, and underneath the original version, and the strings are on the bottom. Next slide, please. Now, here is a similar passage from the B-flat Concerto K-595 with no decoration. three bars are some suggested possible decorations. So something which tries to stay in Mozart's style, uh, but preserves us from a mechanical repetition of what we just heard before. If we go to the next slide, please. Now, at the last two bars of, of this slide begin a similar piano recitative from the D minor concerto middle movement. Next slide. And so on and so forth. And of course, I'm playing it much faster than we would play it in a performance. We'd probably play. And I believe that Mozart would regard such a performance as grotesque. 
that he's written out the scaffolding, the girders, and the fleshing out is to be left to the performer. So... <laughs> and so forth. I mean, there are many, many different ways that you can decorate a passage like that, but there's something really I find profoundly embarrassing about, about that. And we'll see some other parallel examples soon. Next slide, please. That's more of the same. Okay, here's another example. This is K503, the C major concerto, where Mozart writes... <laughs> passage like this is not quite as absurd on the Steinway as it is on one of Mozart's pianos because the decay of the sound is so rapid on the earlier piano uh, that you would lose track of, of the upper notes uh, very, very rapidly. So here are again some suggested uh, decorations. They're by no means the only possibility, but certainly a sequence like that which has such uh, a vague outline was expected to be filled in. And in all of these cases, I would say Mozart improvised his decorations. But even if we are a little bit timorous about improvising, we certainly can create some decorations and uh, write them down and learn them and play them by memory. There's nothing embarrassing about doing that. Of course, it's it's nicer to know that you have a sense of spontaneity and the risk factor is, is a, a very valuable one. Um, you don't make an omelet without breaking eggs, and you have to be willing to take risks. I think one of the things about our present-day music making is that through recordings and splicings and competitions, uh, there is a standardization of performance because of the avoidance of risk. Because if you play three wrong notes, the person who played two wrong notes will advance to the next round, and you won't. Um, it seems to me that, that suspense is precisely the whole issue. So what Alfred Hitchcock did with his films, we need to do a little bit more with Mozart concertos. Can we have a next slide, please? Now, this is the, the one of the, the great examples that I like to show. It's a little hard to read. Uh, what we're looking at here is a written out decoration of the second movement of the A major concerto, K488, this one. Mozart's most plaintive, most sorrowful, and most devastating pieces. Um, this is a manuscript which is found in the, uh, the Berlin State Library. We can go through the rest of it. I am not going to ask you to look at all of this in detail, but uh, we can go on and look at the next slide. And then the next. And the next. And that's the end of it. Now we're going to go on and see these things written in printed music so you can understand what's what's being written. There are here four staves. The bottom two are what Mozart wrote. The, the, the second from the top is the decoration. And the very top one has been done by the editor of the new Mozart edition in regularizing the rhythms, putting in sextuplets and septuplets and so on and so forth so that the rhythms are, are rationalized. Now, as most of you know this piece very well, you will see that it is not beginning at the beginning of the movement. And what that shows us is that what's written down here are only those bars which should be decorated. So not this. Not all the way through. But from here, and 
and so on and so forth. Uh, you can see the rest of the, uh, it is all here. Not, but, and if we can go on. Nothing here. Then now you may find some of these not terribly convincing or stylistically sublime, but some of these ideas are rather good. And so you might begin to wonder who wrote these. And at the time these were published in the new Mozart edition, the identity of the writer of this was unknown. But when the new Mozart edition printed the studies that Mozart's pupils undertook with him, which involved theory, harmony, counterpoint, fugue, free composition. There were three principal pupils he had. One of them was Thomas Atwood, an Englishman. Then there was Barbara Ployer, who was Mozart's own piano student. And there was Jakob Freistetler. And it was possible to identify the handwriting of this embellished version of the A major concerto middle movement as being that of Barbara Ployer. Now, some of you may know that not only did Mozart teach Ployer, but he actually dedicated at least two concertos to her. One of them, the E flat concerto number 14K449, and the G major concerto with which I began my presentation. So, what do you think are the odds that Barbara Ployer, trying to decorate the slow movement of this concerto, is writing 64th notes when Mozart wanted to play quarter notes and eighth notes? I would say, my friends, that the likelihood of that is zero. She would have tried to do what she heard her master and mentor do. That she might not have been able to do it as well as he is a given because who could do anything as well as he? But the fact that she writes down these ornate decorations, also where she doesn't, can you move to the next slide? Yep. Notice that she writes So she doesn't do something here, nor here. Then she writes something, which shows that she's aware of the fact that you don't just noodle everywhere, you see? So this is, I think, a, a, an extraordinary document and one which shows beyond any possible doubt that actually the difference between the way Mozart played his concertos and the way Chopin played his concertos is not so great as you might think. That actually the major difference is that Mozart didn't write most of it down and Chopin did write most of it down. And of course we know that Mozart was one of Chopin's idols. Can we now go on to the next? I now want to go to another aspect of the piano concertos which is quite important. It's not a matter of creative uh, decoration which is what we've seen before this but it is a question of what we call white spots or empty spots where Mozart just simply schematically indicates what he wants. This is the last movement of the E-flat concerto K482 and we see the next page.
Now, I grew up with recordings of this in which that's what the pianist played. And you'll notice that the orchestra is chugging along. And you're playing. Well, I think it, it should be quite obvious that this is in itself rather grotesque. This is the Neue Mozart aus Gabe version of that, and you see that there is an Ausführungsvorschlag. The editor is to be complimented for realizing that that is a, a passage, one wouldn't say that needs to be decorated, but needs to be filled in. Now, if we go to the next page, next one after that, here is that same passage with four different versions of how to decorate. One of them is from the new Mozart edition that you just looked at a minute ago. Two of them are from the Bedura Scotus Mozart interpretation. And the last one is, is mine. Um, the difference between them is that mine is the only one that starts at the bottom note of what Mozart begins with and goes up to the top note consistently throughout the whole passage. So the Heusner angle one starts an octave higher than Mozart writes. So that can't be right, and then comes down, and then jumps down to the, to the low note, which also can't be right, and Bedura Skoda does that too. Uh, my version does not. This is not really a very challenging intellectual job, but it's something that needs to be done. Um, we find it, you can go ahead to the next uh, cue. See more of the same, okay, and we can go on. And that's the end of that. Uh, this is the same thing that happens in the C minor concerto, where you have... Uh, and of course, it happens the second time too. Clearly, these are white spots that need to be filled in. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now you're looking at the C minor concerto. This is, was written on custom 16 stave paper because Mozart needed it because it's the only concerto of his that, in addition to trumpets and drums, has both oboes and clarinets. Note that the strings are up on the top, pianos at the bottom. This is an extremely messy score, very uncharacteristically. The piano part is really hard to to uh, to make out. If we start in the fourth bar of this example, next page. Basically, everybody figured out that these octaves should be one octave scales, just the way the previous ones were. But the question about whether the eighth note should be filled in or not remains controversial. Most people play. But I believe that they should be arpeggiated. And there's a good reason for me to believe that. Let's go to the next slide. That's the same passage in the new Mozart edition. We can go on. Same thing. Let's go on. Now, here, again, we start at the fourth bar, and here he writes, <laughs> meaning that he, he is already going into shorthand. You see what's going on there when he writes so he writes out the arpeggiation for the first of the octave eighth note passages and not the rest so obviously again he's the pianist he doesn't need to know what those notes are because he'll be able to invent them by himself and then again
there is all shorthand. Let's go on to the next slide. Now here in the C major variation, you have this. Now you'll notice that in this passage I can go on. passages you have a one voice single voice single line and then suddenly you've got these block rather clumsy sounding octaves I think it should be if not obvious evident that those octaves are supposed to be broken so the first time around <laughs> This is not the only case in which Mozart writes octaves out in eighth notes to symbolize broken octaves. In the C major concerto 467, I played a little bit of that before, where you have actually... I'm afraid that every recording I've ever heard of it does that, but he plays... can't be dissuaded from the fact that it ought to be up to you to decide whether you want to do it yourselves. Uh, next. This is in the coda. Notice what happens here. He's writing octaves in the right hand. Now, from this point on, he writes only the upper voice and writes a big eight with a long hor horizontal line showing you to continue to play the octaves, which he hasn't written out. And everybody does that. But the left hand... to raise an eyebrow because if you look at the bass part which is underneath it do you notice that there are repeated notes in the cello bass part whereas there are single note values in the left hand of the piano instead of so I wanted only eighth notes then surely he wouldn't have those those single values but if it's shorthand if the pattern of 16th notes of broken 16th is supposed to continue in the left hand then all the way through I'm working on an edition of K491 right now when it comes out in Baronwriter you'll see all of these as Osias so on to the next slide Now it's time to talk about cadenzas. And I hinted at this before, and here is the G major concerto, which I'm using as an example. Mozart sets up a sense of spontaneity by grabbing ideas from different parts of the piece and, and pasting them together. The result of that is that it sounds like he's simply jumping from one place to another, making it up as he goes along. So that if we look at, at one of Mozart's original cadenzas and put it on the right side of our desk and on the left side open up a score and then go through the entire cadenza and identify the bar number of the passage from which each place is extracted, then you get a very, very good crash course with Mozart on how to make cadenzas, whether composing them or, in fact, improvising them. You'll notice that the opening of the piece becomes
That's not from the beginning of the piece. But it, where it is from is from the very end of the recapitulation. <laughs> And you may say to yourself, well, that just shows that I could never do something like that. I mean, the idea of having a deceptive cadence E flat major there, oh my God, what a genius Mozart is. How could I have figured out to put that into the cadenza? Well, you could have because in the opening tutti, So he's quoting that deceptive cadence at that point. And then he goes on. That passage is drawn from another spot in the concerto. Then he quotes again the beginning. And this, that's another quote. So is this. So is this. And those triplets come from the development. So all the way through, Mozart takes little snippets, little fragments of places here and there in the movement, and he weaves them together in a way that sounds like he's just making it up on the spot, picking something out of thin air. The idea, of course, is always to understand that the most important thing about a cadenza is you're waiting for the orchestra to come in after the trill. And therefore, the most fatal thing you can do is to present harmonic stability. So if Mozart had gone this way, that would be a disaster for the idea of a cadenza because there's no expectancy when everything is absolutely solid G major and D7. Therefore, what does he do? He substitutes the 6-4 chord for the G major root position chord, creating a sense of suspense and an expectancy of something that's going to happen. When he quotes the second theme, instead of... and he's about to end up in F major, which has nothing to do with G major at all. So he's got to hit the emergency brake and do something to save himself from an absolute calamity. Wow, I saved myself. Fantastic. So harmonic instability is a central part of writing good cadenzas. But knowing how to steal this little bit, that little bit, and weaving them together is very, very important. The idea of how you improvise a cadenza is imminently connected to how to improvise free fantasies, which Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach teaches in the last chapter of his treatise, his essay on the true manner of playing keyboard instruments, which every pianist should own. And he shows that the prescription of CPE Bach, you write a good bass line that has a good sense of direction, you put some figures on top of it to create syntactically intelligent and uh, coherent harmonies. And then you can, on those curtain rods, you can hang whatever curtains you want, arpeggios, scales, tunes. It's all up to you. And that shows how to do it. We are particularly lucky that there are certain piano concertos for which Mozart has left more than one cadenza. In the case of the Jeune Ami Concerto, the E-flat Concerto K271, we have two different cadenzas for each of the first two movements and three different sets of lead-ins for the last movement. In the A major Concerto K414, we have two sets of cadenzas for the first and second movements as well. And this can teach us a great deal because it shows 
that there isn't just one way to do it. Even if Mozart did write a cadenza to a particular concerto, it doesn't mean you can't write an alternative. Can we see the next slide, please? Yes, just a second. I'm almost done. No, this is, do go on. If you can get us to the E flat concerto, that would be great. But if not, it's not a calamity. Um, you should be able to see it now. I'm not, but that doesn't mean that others are. Hold on. I'm I, seeing oh, myself. <laughs> oh, this is, sometimes we want to do that, but here. Uh, now you should be able to see it. Ah, uh, yeah. Okay. So you see the one of the cadenzas begins at the bottom of the page to the right. We can go on to the next page. Mm -hmm. This is a cadenza which actually dates from the time of the composition of the concerto. If we go to the next page, we'll see the one that he wrote later. And so on. So by comparing these two, we get some uh, real insight into the span of Mozart's creative ability to take the same tunes, the same ideas, and run them in different directions. Now, many people, you know, when cadenzas to Mozart concertos were prepared in the 19th century and in the 20th century, those who prepared them didn't find any particular need to adhere to Mozart's style. Brahms's cadenzas to the Mozart D minor concerto or Beethoven's to the same concerto, among others, Clara Schumann's, all of these modulate to far-flung keys. They are written for the piano of the time, which means that Mozart's five octave range from here to here is exceeded. And the question is, is it necessary to stay within the world of Mozart's cadenzas? Uh, there's a Benjamin Britten cadenza to the K482 E5 concerto, for instance, and there are many different cadenzas to the C minor Mozart concerto, one of them even by Gabriel Fauré in his very uh, late style. These are fascinating uh, to listen to. Uh, there is, however, a kind of a slight feeling of, of discombobulation, a little back to the future part X, uh, when you go into a more modern idiom and then you have to end up with a traditional trill and the orchestra doing the play out in Mozart's style. Um, it's very clear that Mozart and Beethoven themselves didn't care too much about that. Beethoven's cadenzas to his piano concertos were written around 1809, long after he had written most of his concertos. And uh, he used the later range of the later pianos. And, you know, the cadenza to the second piano concerto, which is Beethoven's earliest of the five, sounds a little bit like the Hammerklavier sonata. But that didn't seem to, to uh, bother Beethoven very much. He was perfectly happy uh, to take a trip through time into the future and back into the past. Uh, I myself feel that the idea of a cadenza is to create a, a sense of what the, the performer can do in a creative, imaginative way. It's not really designed to show that you have fast fingers. And as a result, I think the, the idea behind a cadenza ought to be to live within the world that created that cadenza. That is the aesthetic of the 18th century of the Baroque and the classical period in which uh, the idea of improvising and uh, whether singing or playing cadenzas was something that was within a particular frame. 
Uh, as we well know, when Hollywood makes movies that took place in earlier times, they go through tremendous efforts to create backgrounds uh, and uh, use automobiles that come from that time. It would not do to have a 1948 Studebaker going around in a film that was supposed to be made in the Roaring Twenties. And uh, one of the Jane Austen movie filmings, I can't remember whether it's Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice, has a beautiful outdoor scene and at a certain point an airplane flies by. Uh, what amuses me is that probably most people going to that movie would not start guffawing. They wouldn't start laughing uncontrollably because they're so used to seeing airplanes fly by that the idea that, that one might be flying by in 1795 uh, might not strike them as being incongruous. Um, but I, I think the, I, the idea of a cadenza is to live within the, the world, the aesthetic world of the composers. So I would encourage all of you who are so uh, inclined to look at Mozart's language, to digest it, to understand it as, as clearly as you can stylistically, and to start to relish taking risks, because it's only by taking risks that we can save this precious classical music of ours from dying out. And there's a real danger that uh, just through a, a kind of a, a ritual, the music lacks its ability to astonish uh, because we are no longer trying to make it as exciting within its own world as it once were or was. Um, I think maybe this is a good time to, to pause, and if there are others who would like to make comments or ask questions, I would be more than happy to, uh, to do my best. Thank you for your listening and for your attention. Well, Robert, uh, thank you. Thank you for, uh, for, for the incredibly illuminating and uh, inspiring, and I, could, I think I could say, um, or inspiring uh, oh. uh, ability and, and knowledge knowledge that you that you show um, of course I think there are a lot of questions and everybody here is very much encouraged to um, good yes please to ask questions in the Q&A or simply in the uh, in the chat uh, and I will do my best to to um, Give them, pass them on to to Robert. So, where do we start with the with the many many questions that uh, that that I Up think you. arise? Um, I think trying to understand one of the good places that you suggest uh, that I can follow in trying to let's say make uh, make a cadenza is to follow Mozart's models to steal uh, from different places. What are some other practical suggestions that you would give? Because I think a lot of uh, professionals and students uh, that are taking part um, have this thirst. And I think there's the feeling that, well, one's got to be doing something, including encouraged by uh, luminaries such as yourself or Andrea Stein and so on and so forth. But what are some practical suggestions uh, about improv? Well, there are there are wonderful treatises in the 18th and 19th century which can be of enormous help because unlike Mozart's cadenzas, which you can emulate because you see what he does, and after all, we have something like 40 Mozart cadenzas. It's a huge vocabulary uh, there that you can be encouraged to plagiarize. Uh, there are the the treatises which are designed to teach people these things. Pedagogically, I mean, you know, the, the Philip Emanuel Bach book, as I've said, is, is to me an absolutely essential uh, one. And I should point out also, you mentioned that I had uh, edited C.P. Bach. Yes, indeed, I have. And the uh, volume that was entrusted to me was that which contains the sonatas with varied reprises. And these are sonatas which are not terribly well known. People know the Prussian and the Württemberg uh, sonatas, and they know the Kenna and Liebhaber collections. Uh, but they don't know the uh, the varied reprises of sonatas. And what, what C.P. Bach does is he presents the form of a traditional sonata movement, but instead of having a repeat of the first half and a repeat of the second half, he composes out the whole thing and shows you, therefore, how you can redo, retell the story. Uh, and it's very clear. Haydn said that he was tremendously influenced by C.P. Bach, and Mozart said, er ist der Vater, wir sind die Buben. 
You know, he's the father, we're the kids. Anyone who, knows, who does things well owes it to him, and anyone who doesn't acknowledge it is a scoundrel. Um, it made me realize that the way we play Haydn and Mozart and early Beethoven is really not right at all, because we should be doing what C.P.E. Bach shows. And I was fortunate enough to begin my editing process on this at the same time that I recorded all of the Mozart piano sonatas on, on Mozart's own piano. And so those who listen to those recordings, I think, will be quite shocked at, at how much audacity um, and spontaneity is applied to those cadenzas, but I, I hope uh, you'll find them stimulating. Um, the Daniel Gottlob Türk Klavierschule is an essential uh, uh, book. It was written in 1789, and so it's a good moment looking back at most of Mozart's uh, uh, piano concertos, and he gives prescriptions of, of things to do. So uh, there's a lot to, to read and to be inspired by, and it's very practical in its nature. He says things you should do, things you shouldn't do. You know, this this is, uh, you know, when, when, when people say there's no way to know how Bach should be played, I say, well, you know, uh, C.P.E. Bach says that everything he learned about playing and writing music, he learned from his father. And uh, after all, between what, what C.P.E. Bach learned from his father and shows as his son, Mozart learned from his father. And so if you want to understand J.S. Bach, look at his son's treatise. And if you want to understand Mozart's music, look at his father's. There's, there's a lot of very, very useful information that's, that's available there. Um, there are a couple of questions that we can uh, lump together because they're, they're related. Um, mm -hmm. um, Sidesh Guptu, and I'm, I pardon myself if, if I mispronounce the name, is it possible to apply these same ideas to Mozart's work for other instruments? For example, the violin sonatas, the concerti for other instruments, or in those was it expected for the soloist to play what he had written? And at the same time, uh, there is a question from Ronald Vermeulen, who says, no, knowing that there is a direct line between the piano concertos and the operas, could you also take vocal and imitation from the time, for instance, the book of Domenico Cori, as a model for keyboard and imitation? There's no reason why not. And by the way, when we're talking about keyboard specific things, of course, there's the whole Partimento school of, of uh, harmonizing uh, bass lines of various kinds, which is also a very useful thing for pianists. But Clearly, uh, instrumental concertos and operas are all part of the same family as the keyboard concertos. And so naturally, violinists playing the Mozart violin concertos or flutists playing the flute concertos, the bassoon concerto, the, the, all of these would, would be expected to, to improvise their cadenzas in the same manner that, that keyboards would. The only difference that's complicated is that it's not as easy to provide the harmonic support that you can with a left hand and a right hand when you're playing uh, piano concerto cadenzas. So that, for instance, if, if I um, am playing one of the violin concertos and I play... That's self-explanatory. Everyone's going to know that that A sharp is taking us to B minor. But there are other cases, and I go, and what I mean is, and not, if you don't say it, the audience can't know it. So one has to, when one is playing a melody instrument or one is singing, one has to try to make the harmonic content as explanatory as possible. Now, of course, Tosi and Mancini and some of the other uh, vocal tutors are adamant that cadenzas, vocal cadenzas, must be singable in a single breath, whereas most singers today do not find themselves restrained by that. But I would, I would certainly say that the relationship between Mozart's concertos and J.C. Bach's operas, for instance, is actually much more relevant than Mozart's dependence on J.C. Bach's keyboard concertos, which are simpler in their structures and in their ornamentation, there's very, very few cadenzas in J.C. Bach concertos, whereas there are plenty of cadenzas in his operas and his arias and in Mozart's operas and arias. I hope that's helpful. 
I think it is. I can see that um, Andrea Steyer has a raised hand. So let's. Ah, uh, well, that I want to hear for sure. Let's connect him. <laughs> to, Andreas. <laughs> let's see. He's about to join us in audio, and maybe he'll agree to join it, also in video. Can we turn on the camera? Uh, yes. I think uh, so the, no, then I will promote you to a panelist, and then this should uh, work. One second. Thank you. Can you turn on my camera, or I have yes, to? Do I will. I will. I will do it in a in a second. Um, no. You will rejoin as a panelist. There we go. Now we'll see Andreas in a minute as well. Wait. No. Yeah. Now. No. Okay. Okay. There we go. Es sieht vielversprechend aus. Ja, da bist du ja. And hello, lieber Robert. Thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to see you and to hear you. And I couldn't agree more to to all you said. It's it's uh, really good to hear that. There, I have two two very small, unimportant additions. Uh, one is uh, the filling in of the blank spots where he just gives the two long notes on the top and uh, the top and bottom. Um, you said, if I understood you correctly, that uh, you think one should reach those two notes at the moment when they are written, uh, in giving the E flat major concerto example. I would have a slight doubt about it because the other example you mentioned from the third movement of the C minor concerto when you spoke about the scales, which are very obviously to be filled in for the octave leaps, there, of course, uh, you, you wouldn't arrive on the high C at the moment when it's written, because it's written in the, on the second quarter note. So I would tend to think it's much more important to really care about the extreme notes, to reach as well bottom note, unlike Badura's coda. But if you reach them exactly on time, I would have slight doubts. If you have a nice figuration which makes you reach the top note in a sense of rubato slightly later, it could actually be very charming. So this I, is my personal opinion. I agree with that entirely. Uh, you know, I mean, my solution was the most modest uh, uh, mentally because it, it, it doesn't add anything to what is implicit, you know, what he's written. But I mean, there's really no reason you couldn't... <laughs> You, you you could actually become quite creative with with, with all of that so so uh, yeah it's a very important observation that you make and i wholeheartedly accept it so the other small point is you you gave as an example uh, the cadence uh, cadenza of the g major concerto and as far as i can see it is a extreme case of recycling of material that uh, nearly everything, as you showed, uh, is derived from the movement. I would maybe add that, at least that's when I try to, to, to teach uh, improvisation in of Mozart, uh, I would maybe tend to add that as a, on the second level, I always tell them, look at the standard formula uh, figurations, the kind of arpeggios he uses, because you have other cadenzas which are much more playful and less seriously concentrated only on the material. It's even sometimes when I've played this cadenza, I feel sometimes the nachtel, and how do you say in English? Uh, the seams. There are so many of them that's actually tricky to play this cadenza. Others have this element, this element, this element, four, five, and in between there is some nice sort of runs, chromatic or arpeggios or so. So I think it depends a little bit on the character of the movement. The more scherzando or lighthearted, the less thematic it might be. This I tend to observe. I would like to hear your opinion about it. And, uh, and uh, really to 
another exercise for improvisation might be to just make a little catalog of what Mozart uses as, as simple standard devices. And of course, in comparing, let's say, with Beethoven or later composers, what he doesn't use. So to have some, I mean, if you improvise, uh, remark about risk taking, you need, of course, in case your brain runs dry, you need you need arpeggios in the in the key which somehow work and some prefabricated uh, elements which you can always put in in case uh, you 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 just don't remember what you wanted to do. Well, this we is have all these cadenzas by Stefan, for instance, which uh, which can be put in any concerto in the in the matching key so one in order to facilitate the entry or to reduce the the panic of improvisation i think it's it's at least for me it was always useful to 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 have a little repertoire or more than a little of things which don't even have to match at all and then if you just keep playing your head will switch on again hopefully <laughs> <laughs> I should, since you mentioned the G major concerto, I, I, I should like to observe uh, how much I enjoyed your recording of that, that, that concerto. It's really, it's really one of my favorites of all time. Uh, I think it's the idea, of course, of, of connecting things to character is central in Mozart about everything. I mean, you know, I mean, Leopold says in the Violinschule, before you can decide the proper tempo, you must first determine the character. And I think everything depends on the character. That's that's right. And what you say of having a vocabulary of things that you can do, arpeggios, formulas, to help you out, is exactly what jazz musicians learn. They learn these kinds of things because, again, if as you say, if the if the spigot runs dry, you have to have something that you can do. And the, the danger in improvisation is if your mind gets too far ahead of your fingers, or the other way around there are going to be not so good things happen. But there is no question about the fact that there is a variety uh, of how much Mozart uses the movement, the content of the movement in cadenzas. That's absolutely right. I choose the G major because it's a particularly revealing one because, because it shows an encyclopedic sort of thing. But uh, to me, in a way, since everybody, even the Badura Scotus in their wonderful book in its two editions, uh, emphasize deriving the material of the cadenza from the movement. It's important to note that in the 488 piano concerto, which has some of the most glorious tunes of any concerto ever, there's one gorgeous one after another, not a single idea exactly. is in the cadenza, not one, as if he's trying to say, das geht auch, you know, you don't, you don't really need to do that. And in fact, some people think that the beginning of that cadenza, they they say that that comes from the concerto itself, but the concerto doesn't do that. The concerto does. So this one is auftakt, is abtaktisch, and the other one is auftaktisch. So one of them is on the downbeats and the other is on the upbeats. It turns out that the source for this is the second cadenza to K414. Yeah. Yeah. Which was, it was lying on his writing desk when he was writing 488. I think it was. Sorry. You know, so. I mean, in that particular case, we can see also 488 is the only concerto by Mozart in which the cadenza is written into the manuscript of the score, which means that Mozart knew from, from the outset that he was not going to play this piece. And it was written for someone else. Who else? Well, it should be obvious since we have Barbara Ployer's embellishment of the second movement, then it must have been written for her. So I wrote an article about that. But I think you're right to suggest and encourage to people to make a connection in how ri rigorous the, the motivic material is to the character of the of the piece. But we do see this. I mean, if you look at uh, K456, for instance, or some of the other concertos, which have several cadenzas, 
we can see that he experiments. And, you know, sometimes the last concerto, K595, is all sequences based on a very small amount of material. So what is one to say? Thank you for that. It's very helpful. So I think, I think for a... No, go ahead, please. No, no, I, I think uh, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting to, to um, somehow have a look at the cadenzas exactly, at least it helped me a lot, exactly uh, in uh, some consideration of this point, how much content of the to, to, of, of the preceding movement do they contain or how little, and maybe ask, does, is there any, what, what sort of connection could this have with the general character of the movement? Mm -hmm. And then comparing, of course, the two A major cadenzas, it's also, I think, a matter of, of course, a certain tonality is associated to certain favorite uh, molecules. And, and it's, uh, it's not only that those two cadenzas are, are so similar, but somehow, of course, certain things lie in the hand in A major and they wouldn't lie in the hand in F major. So also the tonality produces a certain figuration. Yeah, it was the, it's the effect in Lehrer. Yeah. No, yeah, okay. But also, also. somehow, uh, not, not even speaking about aesthetic things, but sort of what the fingers do themselves if you, if you, if you let them do. That and I think he thinks that way because in, in the case of the two A major concertos and in other cases too, he is borrowing material. For instance, you have Or you have, yeah. and you have, uh, uh, let's see, in the, in the, um, it's, it's very clearly he's, he's, composing the same piece again. It's a kind of a remake. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah. And that, that happens a lot, you know, in the dissonant quartet. And the kutz. I think it just, it, he's in a C major frame of mind, you know, or a, an A major frame of, of, of mind. And I think uh, it helps to bring us a little closer to his, his way of thinking somehow. So it was a great pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bless you, Andre. Stay healthy. And I hope we see one another soon. Yeah. Bye-bye. Lovely, lovely to see you, Andreas. Thank you. Um, there is uh, there are more questions and one maybe that we can we can uh, this is relates a little bit to what was just just said. Borka Plada uh, asks, until what extent do you think Mozart's own ornamentations are pedagogical? Do you think they gain meaning and dramatic purpose when they're written down well you know i i i think the decorations come from a manifestation of a particular style in the 18th century the french had this proverb le style est l'homme même you know style is the essence of the man and we should say of the woman too uh, and the use of, of different kinds of ornaments has something to do with his personality, just the way, you know, you have people who speak German, but they speak, you know, they speak Austrian, they speak Zexisch, they speak Hessisch, they speak Alemannisch, they speak Plattdeutsch, you know, you can read, they all read the same way, but they sound different. And, you know, you have Mandarin and you have Cantonese and you have Taiwanese and so on and so forth. And in America, we have all sorts of different colorations. And Mozart's colorations come from the music that he admired, that he absorbed when, from the time he was very, very young. Um, I find it very interesting that, that his notation of ornaments 
varies. For instance, this kind of, that very standard or, ornament, you find Mozart notated, notates it five different ways. Does that mean that they should be played five different ways, or does it mean that it didn't matter to him because it could be this or that? I remember talking to Malcolm Bilson about this, and he said, well, look, you look at how he writes in his letters. He writes common, you know, come. And he writes sometimes with one M, and he writes with two Ms. It's still the same word, and it still means the same thing. And my feeling about this is that it's not the same. I think in music, these things are more specific. And I think of Mendelssohn, who says, of all the forms of art, he prefers music because in music one can be so much more precise. And this is very interesting because a lot of people think of music as being something in which it's more abstract, and so it can be taken to mean different things by different people. But whether Mozart writes, or he writes, or, you see, I think mean, all of those have specific flavors. So, I mean, it seems to me that we should get used to executing them in different ways. Haydn is different in that respect. What he'll do is he'll write something that's very, very precise in terms of how the ornament should be. And then from after that, it's always written in a simplified way. And I think he's assuming you see, he told you how to do it once. He doesn't have to do it every time. It's boring. It takes too much ink. It's expensive and so on. He doesn't have the time. You know, just, just do it the first time. And I could be wrong about that, but I, I suspect that the thing to do is to try to understand that Mozart and Haydn and, and all of these other composers, Ms. Divicek and, and Van Hal and Dittersdorf and Stefan and, and uh, so on, they're all speaking a certain brogue, a certain accent within a larger musical discourse. But I think we do them better service by trying to make each one of them sound different than just playing them in a general sort of way. I mean, after all, between Bach and Handel, there are worlds that separate them. And one would not want them to sound uh, too similar, I think, from, uh, from one, one moment to the next. And uh, let's, let's talk for a second about the playing the continuo in the, in the Tutti uh, sections. Um, I think one of the questions that many pianists that play it on uh, a modern instrument will have, and with, a, let's say, a modern orchestra, whether this still fits even so sound. I find aesthetically um, it seems to fit more with a, with a, with a period uh, instrument and a period orchestra. What's, what's your feeling about playing this, let's say, in a, in a modern concert situation with a modern concert brand? Well, I, you know, I started to do this after I was studying Hans, uh, conducting with Hans Swarovski. And I engaged him in a conversation about Mozart's concertos, and he was the one who said, if you're going to play Mozart's concertos properly, you have to improvise. And this was in 1966, and I said, what are you talking about? I've never heard anybody improvise playing Mozart's concertos. He said, you haven't heard Friedrich Gula. And I said, no, I haven't heard Friedrich Gula. He said, well, I made a recording of two Mozart concertos you should, with him. You should buy it, listen to it, learn it, imitate it, and, and, and see what's going on. And it was K467, the C major concerto, and K595, the B flat concerto. And I bought it in a record shop in, in France where I was working with Swarovski, and I came back to New York and put the record on, and I fell off my chair. I'd never heard anything like that before. I said, I've got to learn how to do that. And he was playing through all of the tutis. You know, you heard... <laughs> Suddenly, he, there he was, playing. And I thought, darf man das? You know, is one allowed to do something like that? And yet Mozart is writing, you play with the, with the basso. And I started to think about listening to Count Basie or listening to Duke Ellington, where the band is playing and suddenly you hear a little riff, yeah? you know, going on and then it's gone again. So you know he's there, you know something is up. Right now, the piano is accompanying the orchestra, but in a few minutes, the orchestra will start accompanying the piano. The relationship will change. You may not want to play it very loudly because it shouldn't be too, uh, uh, you know, uh, too annoying or too, too central to, to the sound profile. Uh, but, you know, it can convey a great deal of humor. 
if you have and in the middle of that you go just just in the background you know oh there's somebody there you know so what's he going to do now or what's she going to do now so I, I think it, it should not be obstreperous. It should not be too sonically evident. But this and that here and there, I think, adds a bit of personality to the whole thing and shows that there's a relationship between the soloist and the orchestra, which is very flexible. You know, it also involves articulation. I mean, so many people play Mozart legato all of the time. All of the old Breitkopf Complete Works editions Everywhere where there's 16th notes, there are big long slurs or legato. I only know one piece in Mozart's whole life where he wrote the, the word legato. It's in the second movement of 595. And this cello bass is half. And he has two slurs for the half notes and it says legato. But otherwise he never did. So I think from a psychological point of view, it shows a certain liveliness, a humor, a sense of, of something being up. Whereas there is no particular advantage to silence. Silence is what it is. You hear the orchestra play and after a while they stop playing and the piano starts playing and that's that. Uh, <clears throat> knowing where to fill in is also important. We notice that Mozart writes the G major concerto for Barbara Ployer. <laughs> He tells her to come in with a little splash. Why isn't it just? Because it's much more fun to have the piano do that. And yet, in this concerto, you have. The only difference between those two things, besides the fact that one of them has a, a connection and the other isn't, doesn't, is that one of them was written for somebody else and the other was written for him. So when I play that concerto, I do something like that. It comes out of the continual function of of being a lively presence among your friends. And when you play in the old fashioned way, facing the audience with the wind players behind you and the strings on either side, you're visually in contact with all of your colleagues and making music together. Whereas when you do it in the modern sense with a big lid up like this, the wind players can't even hear anything you're playing. And so they now, depend on the conductor. <laughs> They've got to have the conductors. It's the best advertisement for needing a conductor, which you don't need at all. Uh, but if, now, now that they're socially distanced, they can't hear anything. Well, that's, we hope that's not going to last too long. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and actually, there was a follow-up question, a related one from Isle Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Uh, following your remark on the pianist playing along with the orchestra during the Tutti introduction of concerti, what is your view on continuo in symphonies, in particular the, the later ones? Oh, I've had lots of long discussions with, with various people about this. I mean, with Chris Hogwood when he was recording the Haydn symphonies. Um, there isn't any documentary evidence that shows that Mozart expected it, which doesn't mean to say that he didn't do it. And there is, of course, in, I think it's Haydn 90, 97, 8, 9, one of those. It has a B-flat 6-8 finale, and suddenly uh, he's written out... <laughs> He's written out this, these arpeggios for the piano to be played in the performance of the symphony. Now, maybe he was doing the conducting and he did that just to be amusing in, in the same irreverent way that I suggested that, you you know, the old ad American adage, when in doubt, trill. <laughs> <laughs> but but it, is a, it is an open question whether late Mozart symphonies were played with, with uh, we don't have parts that suggest that you know you would need a you would need a part in order to do it because you'd need to know what to play you'd need to know what the baseline is so 
I don't object to it, but I, I'm not convinced that it was there. I mean, the keyboard, the keyboard is already there when you're playing a, a keyboard concerto, so it's a slightly different situation. But I, I hate to waffle about it because it is, it is a, a, a problem. It's one that, that it's not really terribly easy to solve on the basis of documentary evidence. And in the case of the continual playing, the documentary evidence is that Mozart says Colbasso in the left hand of the piano. Very, very clear. So mm -hmm. not to do it. Charles Rosen said you shouldn't do it because it's not dramatic. And it, it takes away from the, the contrast between the soloist and the orchestra. I understand that. I understand it very, very well. But that is starting to come apart when Mozart has... Right away, the, the, the keyboard comes in and interrupts the orchestra. I don't know whether he would have dared to write such a thing if he didn't already have the convention of the piano being part of the sound even though, of course, the sound would not be as loud. It would still be heard because the concert halls were not very loud. So I don't need to hear a harpsichord playing in the Jupiter Symphony. In, in, in opera performances, it was much more likely to use a harpsichord than a forte piano. That, that makes sense. And um, where do you stop? Do, when do you stop doing it? So the Beethoven concertos, Yes, uh, playing. I, I think in Beethoven concertos, definitely, because the, the, especially there, there are hints here and there in the autograph scores that he expected a continual function. For, for instance, in the last movement of the C major concerto. Uh, he writes that G because it's... I mean, it's his way of writing, etc. Mm. But some of the of the concertos were published with 2D reductions, so that the keyboard player could follow the orchestra. But there's no way to understand the continual part for the Emperor Concerto except that he was writing what should be played. He writes figures. He writes Telemannbögen, these these configuration fig conventions, and as I said, he writes octaves. And so it's, it's signal that he writes the continuo there because he knows that he's not going to be playing the piece because his deafness has made it impossible. That's why he also does not allow for a cadenza. You play. And he writes, Non si fa una cadenza, ma s'attacca subitamente il seguente. Don't make a cadenza, which means, by the way, don't improvise one. He doesn't say don't play a cadenza. He says don't make one but play immediately that which follows, which sounds like it's going to be a cadenza, but it turns out that it isn't, and suddenly the horns are coming in. So he, knowing that he's not going to get to play that piece, he is showing people what he expects them to do. Now, my dear friend Hans Werner Kürten, who did the edition of the Beethoven piano concertos for the Henle Gesamtausgabe, he says that all of those continuo notations are to teach Archduke Rudolf the conventions of continuo notations. To which I can only reply in due deference, why would Beethoven teach him to do something that you aren't going to do? The only reason to teach him how to notate continuo is because you're going to want to, some, to have someone play continuo. It makes no sense to teach him how to do figured bass when you don't want them to play it. At least that's that's the way I look at it. Well, it's uh, it's it's very convincing. We had a question that was emailed earlier from from a colleague and a friend uh, in China, Yuan Sheng, who wanted to hear you talk about the uh, pedaling in Mozart. Uh, if you have some uh, comments about the way it was you you suppose it was done at the time and in those instruments and its implementation or translation into um, into our time and possibly our instruments well I don't know uh, does he have does he have some particular piece in mind to which he would apply this 
No, there was. This was a general question, but we can. Uh, there are quite a few uh, particular questions, so so we can we can concentrate. Uh, I'll have to give that some thought. I won't forget. I will think about it. Uh, Peter Ratchsing asks, "Do you hear the piano entry in the D minor concerto as appropriately ornamented?" You mean the first solo entry? I would imagine this. Uh, the question doesn't specify, but I, I imagine the first solo entry. Yes. Well, you see, we see Mozart doing something in the course of his uh, years in Vienna where he decides to give the, the keyboard soloist a personal profile rather than having the soloist come in by citing the principal theme. You know, up until that time, most of the time, the soloist would come in with what we had heard before. Right? I mean, it's it's normal. So you have... But, of course, it's true that in K415, the third of the subscription series, which is... And he goes... He doesn't have the pianist go... Which is completely new material. We haven't heard it before at all. So the identity of the soloist is is presented with with a new idea, but it is never the case that those things are meant to replace the principal theme. They merely delay it. In every case, because. orchestra comes in and plays and you see it's it's always the same kind of thing even if if for instance you you have K503 after this grand entrance it's as if suddenly the orchestra looks around and the soloist is nowhere to be found Wolfgang come on who me yes you it's a concerto for you really little me well you can do it or not we're out of here so you see it's like Lenny Tristano I can't get started can't get going here. Takes him a long time. Ah! Got it, and the orchestra comes in and starts the piece again. Or, right, you, you, you get to the end of that. so delicious absolutely and he gets to the end of that and then the orchestra comes in and plays the the original material again so in the D minor concerto this is this is part of a an idea a concept that he uses not always in the coronation concerto is next to the last which is almost a kind of a parody of, of a Mozart piano concerto it ends up with the same kind of, of fanfare. And a concerto in which, by the way, 60% of the left hand is completely missing. That's another sort of problem altogether. It, it is also interesting to note, you know, sometimes students ask me, how do you, what makes the third movement of a piece, the third movement of that piece? I mean, couldn't you take uh, four Haydn quartets in C major and take the first movement from this quartet and the second movement from that one and the third one and make that into a Haydn super quartet number one? And I mean, you could argue about it, but what's very, very interesting in the case of the D minor concerto, it's very clear what makes the third movement the third movement of that concerto because the third movement is a paraphrase of the first movement because you have... You see, 
see, so if you listen to this. Quite evidently the same piece said in a different way which is really quite quite wonderful and I suppose it's possible to go through one's entire life and discover maybe at the age of 80 or never at all that those are basically the same tune uh, and, and speaking about this a uh, little bit you mentioned for the CP Bach uh, with the pieces that you edited where the first uh, and the second repeat were, you know, literally sort of re composed out, they're written out, recompositions and so and written out. Um, can you talk about, you said that this made you view Mozart's and Beethoven's early sonatas. And can you talk about repeats in, in, in those pieces in that in that context and also what implications you've uh, um, drawn for your stories from, from right this, this does not affect concertos much because concertos rarely have repeats but in variation movements of concertos they do so you have essentially the same piece without being the same piece. But doing it twice is not necessarily rewarding, and I rather doubt that Mozart would have done that. He would have become bored. But in the sonatas, it's another matter. And in the sonatas, uh, again, you can you can decorate in, in all sorts of ways. You know... <laughs> All of them being little pieces and snippets, little ideas that you find in other pieces by Mozart. You're not, you think you're inventing, but you're not really inventing. You're just simply, you know, you're just simply a, a, a common thief. But this, what, what it began to raise in my mind, and this is something which in this forthcoming recording of all the Mozart sonatas may cause people outrage. I started to think about when Mozart writes the, the re recapitulations of his sonatas. And there are decorations, which there sometimes are. Is what he writes the first time or the second time? There's no way to know that, right? We don't really know. So, for instance, in the last movement of that, get to and the second time it's like asking for one more cookie and his mother says no you're going to bed right now there's that that lovely cocky little deceptive cadence but maybe that wasn't supposed to be played twice because the second time it's not very funny it's not very witty because you already know oh here comes the deceptive cadence you see maybe becomes very witty because it was completely unexpected. I don't know. These are things, I think one of the things that one has to, the more one is fascinated by a subject and studies it, the more important it is to admit that one doesn't know things that one doesn't know. You know, when you are listening to, uh, you know, and, and you're going along, uh, And so on. The second time around, what happens in in, in that passage? Uh, you you have this absolutely catastrophic 
throwing yourself under the bus, you know, just trying to do anything to stop the... <laughs> but maybe that's only supposed to be played the second time. You know, when it becomes a true shock because you don't expect it. But this, when you heard... And the second time... You know, what have you done for me lately? I, I really wonder about these things. And, and I, I didn't do all of them in my recording, but I did some of them. And I think some people are going to be really outraged. They'll think, what, what right do you have to do that? And what I would say is, I'm trying to communicate what's going on in the piece, psychologically what's going on, and the difference between what you expect and what you get. And there's no way in the 18th century that you could do that, save to do what C.P.E. Bach did, which is why he's such a revolutionary. He wrote the thing out twice to show you what to do. Other composers didn't. Haydn most often wrote out the, the decorations that he wanted because he wasn't much of a keyboard virtuoso, although he played very, very well. But Mozart was a keyboard virtuoso, and I think he did these things a lot. I can't prove it. But the question is, in the end, if you're unprejudiced, if you were hearing the piece for the first time, which one of these alternatives is more likely to be exciting in a positive sense? Not, not doing something for the sake of scandal, but something which contributes to the expression, to the intensity of the discourse. And would you do this uh, also in, in, in Beethoven sonatas? I, see your... I, I think I would, yeah. I think I, I, think I, I really would. I mean, in, in pieces like the last movement of the Opus 75 Sonata, certainly I would play a little... Uh... I mean, it's, it's, it's in the style, right? I mean, Beethoven is writing these fermatas on dominance in the same manner that Mozart wrote fermatas on dominance, calling for an eingang, for a lead-in that would connect them. So there are, there are things that it, I think I would do. I wouldn't do it in the Waldstein Sonata. I wouldn't do oh, it in the Hammerklavier. Not in 111 in the repeats. No, no, I, I, don't, I don't think that would, that would do, you know. It's, uh, Beethoven has passed over a borderline into a completely different world. But it doesn't mean... It doesn't mean that I would never in any music after 1810 ever add something. Because there are times when, I, when I'll add a little ornament in a piece by Brahms. Why? Because, because I heard him do it someplace else. And if it could be done someplace else, why not there? Uh, there is a question uh, from, uh, from our colleague and a dear friend, Elder Nebolsin. Uh, probably a minor question, but it would be lovely to hear your opinion about going beyond the high F of Mozart's available keyboard while playing cadences like, for instance, the great van der Landowska. Well, she was not alone, and, and uh, I also have great reverence for van der Landowska. I personally feel, as I said, Hollywood getting cars from the right years and photographing buildings that were in existence at the time that Mozart lives very, very well within his five octaves. There's only one piece by Mozart that goes beyond the five octaves, and it's the two piano sonata where there's one F sharp, which means that there had to be a piano which went up to G because you don't have, have keyboards that end in sharps and flats. And so Josef von Auenhammer must evidently have had a piano that went up to G. So he, he wrote an F sharp for her, for that case. But, but F is, is a real border in Mozart. And I find Beethoven, on the other hand, bumps his head on the top and stubs his toe on the bottom and shakes his fist and says, why can't you make me a piano which has some more keys, for God's sake? And by the time he gets to the Hammerklavier, he wants a low B flat and he's got a C. He just barely got the C. And not these days people do that. I tend to play the Beethoven the way it's written because once you start to recompose them, there's no end to what you could do. But look, look, I mean, Mo Mozart has a sense of humor about these things. Uh, speaking of this concerto, you know, you have...
So in the exposition, suddenly he goes down like that. As if womanizer that he was, he was walking down the street and he saw a rather pretty girl on the other side of the street and his head, ooh. And so then, but the only reason he did that was he couldn't go. He didn't have the G. Now we have the G. Should we play it? It's much less interesting. Or he plays. works perfectly fine but then the next time it happens he starts and he's already hit the top note of the piano on the first of these five bars what's he going to do when he's trapped he's trapped and he goes I mean it's it's, it's fantastic he says well when you got me you got me I am not I can't but when I learned that concerto from Shermer with the Isidore Philippe edition, it reads. Which just sounds like it comes from another era, which it does. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm, I'm skeptical about it. I don't think you lose that much by staying within the boundaries. But I mean, of course. <laughs> We don't mind it so much in Beethoven because later Beethoven does exceed that range. I mean, the last piece, which is for five octave piano, is Opus 31, number three. And there's also Opus 14, number one, which has an F sharp in it that no one's ever been able to explain. Hmm. So, I mean, there, there are these, these incongruities that, that, that one has. But I think Mozart really made a, a, a very, very clever and witty uh, attempt to live within the bounds of, you know, of, of the piano that he had at his time. And it's also interesting that he could have bought a piano that had more notes, keys on it during the 10 years he was in Vienna, but he was perfectly happy to remain with his five octave Walter, mm. which suggests that that was not the most important thing to him. With Beethoven, it was an important thing, you see. And as soon as he gets a piano which has the F sharp and G that Mozart's pupil had, he uses it right away. <laughs> Says, I wanted it, I wanted it, and I got it. But by the time it's published, he has a piano that goes up to C. And you know something? He doesn't fix all of the spots. He only fixes some of them. And one of the weirdest ones of all is... Which is, I mean, what's more important to the theme of the, to that piece than the theme of the A flat? But then in the Cleedance... He goes only up to F because at the point that he wrote the concerto, he only had a G and he didn't have an A flat. Why not? Nobody does it. I don't think it's occurred to anybody to do it. Do you? Well, I play it on, on Beethoven's own piano, but of course it does go up to a C. So sometimes I do it and sometimes I don't. That's you the... know, there's such a thing as being too puristic, I suppose. And Donald Francis Tovey once said that he held himself to be a purist in performing the middle movement of K488 in not limiting himself to the printed text, which I think is a very, very elegant way to turn things upside down. Not... Did I see that Kathy Debrecenie was on here? Uh, she made a comment or something. Yes, there, is a, there is a question that she asked. Uh, Kathy asked, thank you for the fascinating yes. talk. Could you give us a few tricks? of harmonic progressions for cadenza writing for those of us who would improvise but are happy to try our hand in writing one. Well, I, I think the, the important thing, first of all, is to understand how important it is to substitute six four chords for, for tonic common chords, uh, tonic root position chords, to create a sense of that this is important, not this. And this is a case in which one can look at the piano concerto cadenzas and write down the harmonic progressions, the bass line and the harmonic progressions, and use them as a basis for writing violin concerto cadenzas. And 
if someone wants to get an idea of how this works, some years ago I wrote for Gidon Kramer cadenzas to all five of the Mozart violin concertos. And what I did was, I'm, I'm sure Kati knows these, what I did was I wrote two basic versions for each place that required a cadenza. And then there are little circles with a number and arrows. And everywhere where there's an arrow and a number, it means you can jump to that spot. So if you take those two basic cadenzas and then try all of the jumpings that are possible, you can make 20 cadenzas. And by the time you've made 20 cadenzas, you basically say, oh, I get it. I see it. I, I don't need this. I can close this book again. I can do it myself. And you can see that, that what I've done is based on harmonic progressions of bass lines. And those are very, very well represented. And of course, we have a few very precious cadenzas which are not for piano, namely the two in the, in the violin viola concertante. It's for two instruments, but it still gives you a, a, an idea of how he uses the material in the movement uh, to, uh, to very good advantage. And there's actually, since you mentioned the um, viola, uh, there is a there was a question from Nibhyanyasa. Sorry if I mispronounce. Thank you so much for this truly interesting discussion. My question relates to the viola concerto. Did you take Mozartian ideas for the cadences that you wrote, or did you aim to stay truer to the Hofmeister summits? I think they're fantastic, and writing, trying to write a cadenza for the Grauen viola concerto at the moment, so I'd be very grateful for a tip. Well, thank you very much for those kind words. Uh, I wrote the cadenzas to the Stamitz and Hofmeister concertos for my dear uh, friend and colleague Kim Kashkashian, with whom uh, I have been playing for many, many years. Um, the question to whether I am borrowing from Mozart uh, or Hofmeister or Stamitz is, as the Germans say, Jein, yes and no together. Um, in in a sense, the way the idea that you start with something from the primary group, the first theme or the, the themes which are heard in the first half, uh, and you then have a, a, an arrival on a dominant seventh chord, and then you have something which comes from the secondary group, which Mozart does a great deal. We see thing from the primary group and then the secondary group. So you have that. Um, that that procedure is something that I used, but of course I took care to use tunes that all came from the concerto itself. So it it represents music which is very clearly connected to the concerto, but using a strategy which which uh, Mozart had had perfected. Um, I remember Kim when I delivered this Kaufmeister concerto cadenza to her. She said, it's all very good, but there's, there's, there's a real problem. I said, what's the problem? She said, it's better than the concerto, <laughs> which was very, very sweet of her. So I'm not going to suggest that you dumb down the cadenza to make it sound more like Hofmeister, but the idea is, is basically going to be the same. Although it's quite possible that Hofmeister himself would have uh, had a cadenza improvised that used fewer themes as Andrea Steyer was saying, and the, the, that would be perfectly possible to do. I mean, using less borrowing in a way is easier than using more. But the way I wrote those cadenzas was to page through the concerto and find, oh, there, I could use that, and then I could use this and that. And by the way, when I first started to improvise cadenzas, that's the way I did it. I would be in my hotel room, you know, at five o'clock, taking a nap before the, the concerto performance that evening, and I was thinking, now, what could I do? What could I do? How, how could I get a cadenza? And I thought, hmm, well, I could start with that idea that comes from bar 24. Yeah, that's good. And then I could make a, caden a, 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 a kind of a sequence and I could go to a dominant seventh chord. Yeah, that would be good. And then, then I would quote the second theme, you know, but not stable, uh, not, not root position, but that. And then I could have a little sequence and then I would get to a 6-4. And yeah, that sounds good. That's good. Now let me see. Okay, page twenty-four, uh, bar twenty-four, and this and that. And I felt very good. It was fine. It was like telling someone how to get to your house to come to dinner. You know, you get on the on the autobahn and you get off at, at exit number forty-two, and you go to the bottom of the ramp, and there's a traffic light, and you make a left turn, 
and you go for for two kilometers and you will see that there there is a, a filling station and you make a right and you go past the school and our house is the second on the left you know so that's the way they do it and so then i was happy that i was going to start with measure 24 and all of this and then i would start to play and what happened to me is the same thing that would happen if you went down the ramp at the at exit 42 and instead of going left at the traffic light you made a right because you forgot and suddenly there is no filling station and there is no school and there is no dinner and i was starting to play and it was not happening the way i knew it was supposed to play and i started to think what am i supposed to be doing and while i'm trying to think of what i'm supposed to be doing i'm making a mess because I can't think of what I should have done at the same time as I should think of what I should do. I'm where I am, I've got to do what I'm going to do, and I have to manage to make it work somehow. So I just had to throw everything to the side. And I thought, it's not worth trying to memorize a procedure when it's just getting me aggravated and confused and messed up. Of course, there's one thing I didn't say about Mozart Cadenzas that I really have to say, which is one of the sacred rules besides being not stable harmonically is you are not allowed to modulate you do not go to other keys don't tell me that beethoven does it beethoven does it beethoven modulates all over the place in his d minor mozart concerto cadenza in his own concerto cadenzas he modulates it's fine with him that's part of his language by the way it's a problem in a way because when you are modulating in a cadenza you for you lose touch of where you are and the whole fact is that you have to get to a trill and it has to be over and suddenly if you're in b major in a piece in g major then the sense of it having to come to a certain place disappears but that's okay if it was okay for beethoven's okay for me when i improvise a beethoven cadenza there's a little switch in my brain and i flip the switch modulation okay when i'm playing mozart switch down modulation not okay <laughs> it's just something that's it's part of his signature it's part of what he does and doesn't uh, mean he hasn't can't have a strange chord oh my heavens really well i could i could i could i could but you know i'm not gonna do it so that's not a modulation. That's the threat of a modulation. He might go to C flat, but if he had done this. Then he would have modulated. He would have gone to C flat major and that would be verboten. And, uh, and is this verboten, you think this is his personal, let's say moral codex, or this is just I think it, not it, done at the time and then already Beethoven is the revolutionary, or would, would C.P. Bach have been modulated in his cadenzas? His cadenzas are much shorter and so the issue doesn't come up. But, uh, you know, all of these things have to do with the personality of a composer and what make up their, their uh, individual language. So you you have this this situation of some composers um, most of them modulating and mozart maybe not but there are many things that mozart does that other composers don't do for instance he is essentially the only composer who believes that an opera should end in the key in which it began and you might say well who cares after three hours <laughs> Who cares whether Marriage of Figaro, having begun in D major, ends in D major? The Cosif Antute begins in C major and ends in C major. The, the Magic Flute begins in E flat and ends in E flat. But they do. And that doesn't happen by coincidence, right? It happens because he wanted it to happen. Why? Because he is looking at the Aristotelian theory of drama, which is you have to have unity of place, time, and action. Things have to take place within 24 hours. Look at Shakespeare, you see? And so Mozart is undoubtedly thinking, what is the musical equivalent of the unity of time, place, and action? Ah, having the piece end in the same key it began. It's wonderful. But it means that he's plotting out his tonal relationships all the way through the opera, so they end up where they need to end up. And it's amazing. So I think not having a modulation in the cadenza is a little bit like having an opera end in the key it began. If you want it to sound Mozartian, then that's something to do. One of the things you said on the phone when we were speaking 
was about the uh, earlier versions that are of, of certain passages that are more complicated than uh, than what, what ended up being printed later and you were talking about the relationship of Mozart's uh, practicing uh, to uh, to to uh, the complexity of the things and even at this opening example that we heard you said this is one double trill in, in well in, in the okay. passage and in, in you you played it uh, in K450 originally was devilish and then and he changes that to and he was which any child can play so it was four o'clock in the afternoon and he thought oh damn I don't have time to practice this well wait a minute I'm the composer I can do anything I want but you and I, dear Kiri, we and all of the listeners, we have time to practice. And most of the time, the original versions are actually more interesting. They're devilish, they're hard, but why shouldn't we learn them? When, when Mozart is improving his music, and sometimes he, he'll make a very subtle change, like he'll change this. And he notices he's got the B twice. He changes it to which is more elegant. So that's an improvement. I wouldn't change that back to the first version. But when becomes I mean, you can decide you like one better than the other, but one of them is more devilish and more virtuosic. That's the D major concerto K451. And you can look as he makes the corrections with his pen from the color of the ink and whether he has already got the corrected version in the recapitulation, you can figure out when he made the change. For instance, in this, he goes, right? So, then he goes, so this, back, upside down, and then he changes it to, he changes it to that, this is a lot easier, Speaking about but the this is more interesting, and then maybe later, Maybe you do that, and you could say that's going too far. That's no longer Mozart. Well, maybe not, and maybe so. But those, those, this changing this to this doesn't make the music better. It simply makes it easier. Just the way Beethoven, he writes it, and he says, "Osia più facile." He says, "Yeah, that's 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 the uh, for people who are having trouble." All of us have trouble sooner or later. True. Um, Jovan Cabanya asks, do you think that C minor sonata last movement was in the first edition approved by Mozart? The Mozart C minor sonata? I think so. This is what she means. Well, it was certainly published that way. I, you know, the, the original, uh, uh, the autograph shows that the, the third movement was originally the second movement, and there were only two movements to the sonata, and then he added the middle movement. By the way, the Stiftung Mozarteum publishes a ROM CD, which has a color facsimile uh, of the autograph and a performance of the, the sonata uh, on Mozart's own piano and all of the decorations that he added afterwards. It's really a, a terrific thing to see. But um, uh, this was was part of the concept of the sonata from the from the outset. Incidentally, there was a simple question earlier, but I'm sure we all want to uh, to know. Uh, Suali asked, "When will your your uh, edition of 491 be published?" Oi, uh, I I wish soon. 
I'm in the middle of writing a book on the Mozart piano concertos, and I have to put the 491 edition to the side until it, it, quite a bit of it is done. The the proofs the proofs of the score are are basically done, but I'm examining uh, some of the other sources, one in, from the Czech Republic and and early editions and so on, because I want to make sure I get these things right. There there are many things that are wrong with standard editions of of, of the C minor concerto. I'm sorry to say. And uh, there are problems in the orchestra parts too, missing missing passages, and and uh, there too Mozart makes corrections that are not necessarily improvements, and so there are going to be some osias there. But uh, some of them I've discussed just earlier about this. But it will probably be at least a year before before it comes out. I'm I'm sorry for that. Well, we'll be waiting. <laughs> Uh, listen, Robert, and I know you have a lot of things to do, like books to yep. write and everything, <laughs> everything else. And and I think your, your brilliance is obviously and knowledge is inexhaustible. So uh, one promise that I hope to extract from you is that you agree to come back and talk about anything. Obviously, it's a carte blanche, but uh, but I hope this can extend over more uh, encounters with you. And we have so many questions, some of which. Uh, I wasn't able to get to, but one thing I do want to get to before before you uh, go back to uh, writing books and and going about your day, uh, you said you might improvise a fantasia for us, and, uh, not necessarily submitting submitting a team here, but it would be a joy to hear more of your playing and to hear you improvise. Oh, my hands have gotten cold. Well, does someone want to give me a tune or something? Um, are we going to do that? Because uh, if I just start to play something, people will think, "Oh, well, I prepared it." And if, if if it's going to be as chaotic as it usually is, then I need to have some. Well, let's say uh, Friedemann is 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 here. Uh, I think we met before the, the dean of Kronberg Academy. So I don't. And you mentioned Sinfonia Concertante before. So something relating to the Sinfonia Concertante. The the viola, violin viola. Yes. Uh, okay, um, let's see, maybe, maybe second movement of 364, okay, well, something else? Um, something, oh, you mean you are going to interpolate several uh, themes, more things, well, why don't you, I'm sure people in the chat have a lot of ideas. Yeah, yeah, just to uh, have, them, have them say. Type in the chat. Uh, Either an indication of which piece or which opus, uh, which uh, which curtain okay. number. Kafal. Somebody says, says Adagio B minor, Stephen. Okay. Oh, that's interesting. We go from C minor to B minor. Somebody says, says first duet of Figaro. We have which the, which from Figaro? The first, first duet. Duet of Figaro. We have. Well, that's that's actually the, the 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 first thing in the in the opera is the first duet. I suppose that's what you, what he means. I think that's, that's what young you means. Some okay. Four ninety two, one, one. Of course, somebody <laughs> inevitably mentioned uh, Requiem Lacrimosa, Peter Okay. There was a mention the minuet in D. Uh, oh, I got enough. <laughs> well, I'm just, I'm just kidding. You know, you open the, you right. the Pandora well, let's, let's see what happens. There's actually quite quite a bit of, of slow music here, uh, but that's that's okay. We'll 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 deal with that. All right. Okay. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. This is absolutely, absolutely stunning, of course, and um, and I think very, very inspiring for for, for all of us. So I thank you, Kieran. Well, you see, I also took care to end in the key that I began. I practice what I preach. <laughs> yes, you you certainly do, and uh, and uh, it's a very inspiring and lively preaching for us. And so I want to thank you. I want to thank all of you that that took part for all the questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to all the questions, but obviously, as I said. We just need uh, more of you in many ways, and I hope you will agree to come back and speak about more things with us. And, uh, Absolutely, Kira. Thank you very much for the honor that you bestowed in inviting me. It was a privilege, and I had a very good time with you the, together. The honor is ours, so here's to next time. And uh, this is it for this month, but I look forward to seeing all of you in March, uh, please sign up for the newsletter if you want to hear about the upcoming ones and uh, and spread the word. Everybody that is interested is very welcome uh, here at the forum here at the Kronberg Academy virtually. I'm very grateful for your hosting uh, this series and uh, well, stay healthy. Thank you, Robert. And uh, thanks to you. Let's see each other soon. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.